Let's go for it. Okay. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to the latest installment of ABT's pop-up book club, where we discuss upcoming American ballet theater ballets based on great works of literature. We're excited to have you all join us today and explore the world premiere of ABT's newest full-length ballet, Crime and Punishment, based on, yay, yay. <laughs> based on Fyodor Dostoevsky's 1866 psychological thriller. We have a great conversation for you all today, digging into the dense novel's adaptation and the complexity of characters. Joining me are my colleagues and fellow dancers, as well as an integral part of the Crime and Punishment creative team, James Bonus. Hello. He's over there, he's on my left, okay. My name is Claire Davison, I'm in the Court of Ballet and I joined ABT in 2012. I will be premiering Katerina in Crime and Punishment on October 30th. And I'm very excited to be a part of the process of bringing this amazing story to the stage. I'd also like to introduce our panelists. We're joined today by four very special guests, including, as I mentioned, James Bonus director and co-treatment writer of Crime and Punishment. James has worked extremely closely with choreographer, co-director and treatment writer, Helen Pickett to bring this story to the stage. James has long directed theater and opera with recent dance ballet partnerships with choreographers, Helen Pickett and Sophie LaPlane. Also with us are principal dancers, Cassandra Trinari and Herman Cornejo and Corda Ballet member Joseph Markey. Cassandra and Herman will make their debuts as Raskolnikov on October 30th and October 31st, respectively. Um, and clarifying for those at home that, and we'll get into this later in the conversation, but yes, both female and male dancers will be dancing the role of Raskolnikov during the fall season. And finally, Joseph will make his debut as Lusion on October 30th with the premiere of this work. So let's dive in. Um, first off, dancers, uh, please reiterate who you're playing in Crime and Punishment and give us an initial description of your character's qualities. Uh, let's start with Cassandra. Ooh, okay, pressure. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm Cassandra Trinari, Um and I am uh, Raskolnikov. Um, okay, how to describe one of the most complicated <laughs> characters in literature. Um, I think sort of tackling like qualities like extremely intelligent, um, sort of isolated and lonely and feeling like the burden of extreme poverty. Um, I learned throughout the book that this is also someone who's also someone who's extremely caring, um, someone who uh, injustice uh, is impacts this person in such a profound way. Um, this is someone who has a quality that's attractive to other people. Um, and it, sort of takes this person the entire story to sort of recognize that there is real love and goodness in the world. But um, I'm sure I'm missing a ton of other qualities that aren't coming to me in this moment, but that's why James yeah. and Helen are also here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it's one of the hardest uh, role to, to, to yeah, put it on stage. Um, it's so, it's so complex, right, Cass? I, I find there's the range of uh, emotions and um, the shift between the the control that he wants to have and, and the chaos that is happening in his head. Um, it's so dramatic that I find one of the hardest roles um, that I had to, yeah, to put in, in my body. Um, and I think uh, having this contemporary work around it um, we can find uh, these layers. Uh, I think the contemporary work would allow us to go deeper into these characters. Um, but yeah, I think it's fascinating. And uh, to also be in the studio, you portraying Cassandra, the, the main role in, in me as well, and making it look so different as well. I think we have that liberty to 
um, going and try to find our own way um, to put that, you know, um, make this character happen. Yeah, it is really exciting. And we're all sort of finding it in real time. And also it's worth mentioning that Joseph is also learning the role of Raskolnikov and will undoubtedly have performances in the future because you're so brilliant in it. And we're all kind of picking each other's brains, <laughs> sort of um, how each of us want to choose to respond. And James is such a brilliant sort of usher of um, allowing us to have autonomy and trying everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also find that throughout this process, there's no wrong and right. Yeah. Um, there's just um, yeah a, a mix of you know trying different possibilities and how would that uh, you know transcend the, the the station for the audience to understand what we're trying to to say. Mm -hmm. James, <laughs> I know you have so much to add. <laughs> I, say, well, I think I think that once you kind of come up to meet really great complex characters, whether that's in a Shakespeare play, <clears throat> King Lear or Hamlet or Raskolnikov in this novel. And there's lots of examples through literature, but the really great complex characters always contain inside them almost irreconcilable contradictions inside the person. And I remember a director when I was acting saying to me, what you've got to do as an actor, and therefore that applies to you as a dancer, is find the internal friction for your character, because that's where the drama exists. Is this, and it creates energy friction, as we know. If I rub my hands together, it produces heat. And that energy inside yourself of how you try to resolve a set of contradictions that are irreconcilable creates enormous energy. And I think one of the things that's really struck me when I was first reading Crime and Punishment was the energy in Raskolnikov. He has this furious, extraordinary energy that leads him to a kind of febrile quality where sometimes he literally collapses, just passes out with it. And yet he's like one of those, um, when you burn, <clears throat> it's magnesium, isn't it? Burns with a very bright white light and burns itself out. He's sort of a bit like that. He sort of burns with this incredible kind of brightness and then collapses. <clears throat> and so I think what you were talking about, Cassie and Herman, is that he, the reason it's so interesting to explore Raskolnikov as a person is he's both empathetic and generous and impulsive and violent. He's a murderer. He acts on the moment and yet makes plans. He's incredibly smart and yet incredibly naive in some ways. So that these big kind of swings and roundabouts that you get as a performer to dig into, in many ways, you can't hope to resolve them and you can't hope to finish the job. It's not the point. Do you see what I mean? It's that you just come up to meet the person and you spend some time with them. It's the same. I was like, one of the things, because I work a lot in opera, and I guess you'll probably get this as dancers as well, but actors don't get to do it. In opera, someone will learn the role of Don Carlos by Verdi, and they might sing that for 15 years or 20 years of their life. They might sing it multiple, multiple times in many different shows, productions. And these really great characters, you don't need to worry about finding it in one shot because... If you dance this this year, Herman, as Raskolnikov, and then you were to dance it two years later, he'd be different because you are. You've changed. Mm. So the thing you bring to it changes. And that's exactly why, in a way, what's been so interesting working with Joseph and Herman and Cassie and Brianne, who's not here today, she's also learning Raskolnikov, is a, it's brilliant that they're different because it's such a complex thing that you're encountering in him that, of course... Cassie, you approach from yourself that role. And there will be certain things that strike a chord with you in the novel or in the story. The same with her man, the same with Brie, the same with Joseph. So I find that actually, when you've got real depth to get your hands on, it never does come easily. But that's the joy, mm. I think. That's what's really interesting. Um, Joseph, you, guys, yeah, you should say who you're playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Hi, I'm Joseph, and I'm playing Lujin, uh, as well as learning Raskolnikov. And Lujin's quite a bit less complex. Um, very insecure character. Uh, very controlling character. A lot of his, I don't know, pride in himself comes from his wealth and how he, and in turn, uses his wealth over people. Um 
Yeah. He's engaged to Raskolnikov's sister and sees that relationship as not necessarily a relationship that he genuinely cares about, but a relationship that it will further him in society with a beautiful wife and then connections to a smart and intelligent man like Raskolnikov. So a lot of what Luzhin does is weighted and um, very, uh, what's the word for it? Very put together to uh, bring himself up the ladder in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's extremely insecure, you are. Yeah. Um, and Raskolnikov has an ability because he's insightful and sensitive to perceive very quickly where to press the buttons with people. So he can see exactly which button to press with Luzin. In a way, Luzin kind of represents everything, many of the things that Raskolnikov stands against. Yeah. To me, it's almost antithetical to him. Well, and Raskolnikov definitely finds a way pretty much with everything he says, even his presence to push Luzin's uncomfortability. I, I think part of why we have the tension is because he feels threatened mm -hmm. by the character and how comfortable he is and how actually intelligent he is. And it's not an act, whereas Lucian's is a bit of an act. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> it feels close to what they feel like, isn't it, as people? Yeah. Hmm. Definitely. Um, we already started sort of diving into this, but to, do, to go deeper, for each of you, what aspects from the novel did you grab onto as an artist um, to bring to your personal portrayal of Raskolnikov or Illusion? I don't think I can pick from the novel a part. I think what I take from the novel is the com how complex is, is his writing. Um, I think the way it's been written is so complex and 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 I think I, I take that into the choreography um to portray to portray the role um and and I think that's what uh you know the works of Helen um comes alive how to uh, not only depict the story but also depict the the writer um you know and the story that we're telling is from um very specific um, writing, and and I think we we put this uh, intricate writing into the steps into how Raskolnikov dances. Yeah, it certainly shapes the physicality, for sure. Um, I think you know, for me, I'm just kind of going through the novel and trying to get as much of who this person is and what qualities can I relate to but the I'm still sort of finishing the book actually and I'm I'm finding that you don't really get a ton of the juice until towards the end <laughs> if that makes any sense um but you know it's it's actually bizarrely even though this is somebody who commits such a an unspeakable act it's deeply human like I'm reading about someone who feels so passionately about standing up for what's right um in his mind in our mind um someone who experiences deep um isolation and loneliness and doesn't necessarily know how to articulate how they feel you know so I'm just kind of like picking apart these aspects of this character that I can certainly identify with. Um, there is an extreme sensitivity there. Um, and also um, how there's like this self-loathing there in a way um, that I think everyone can identify with from time to time when things aren't necessarily going the way you'd hoped. Um, so it's, yeah, there's a lot of layers there, but in a bizarre way, um, also deeply relatable, if that makes any sense. Um, and I can certainly um, 
I think what's what's actually been really, really fun is to play with uh, allowing myself to have rage <laughs> on stage. That isn't necessarily something that um, is asked of a ballerina um, very often. So that's been really interesting to play with. Um, yeah. I don't know if that really answered the question, but. Um, I think for me, in terms of Lucien, there's a lot of times in the book where you're reintroduced to him. You know, kind of go away for a bit. You'll talk about him in, I don't know, passing between the family. And then you're reintroduced and he's always uptight. He's always has that nervous quality, um, especially, you know, after his first meeting with Raskolnikov doesn't go well. He's never then able to kind of calm back down as a character. Every meeting is is with fear and anxiety kind of just all throughout. But then there's also a part where um, he specifically requests to meet with Raskolnikov's sister and mother alone. And they end up bringing Raskolnikov and his best friend as well. And he kind of goes off on a tangent about how he's not going to do anything that they want now because they didn't listen to what he said and didn't follow the rules that he set in place. So kind of understanding his idea of control in situations from that situation uh, is definitely something I pulled from the book. I always find it fascinating, Joseph. We talked about it the other weekend. He does a thing which I think is just absolutely monstrous, where Raskolnikov's family <clears throat> have fallen on hard times, so they don't have much money, and Raskolnikov's pretty much in penury. He can't really even feed himself. And he doesn't know his mum and his sister have come to the city. They've come to the city to, to find him and see if he's okay. And Dunya and Luzhin have kind of got together, and Luzhin's rich. I mean, he could put them up in a really nice place. And instead, he deliberately puts them in an absolute dump. I mean, it's awful where he puts them on purpose to humiliate them. Yeah. So that in their humiliation, they feel how bound they are to him. So rather than him putting them up in the Ritz or somewhere fantastic and then feeling grateful, he puts them somewhere awful so that they, they feel the shame of their poverty and in that embarrassment feel their need of him, which is an unbelievably cruel thing to do. So he has a sort of controlling... Uh, cynical, cruel streak, which is just really gobsmacking, I find. It's kind of, yeah. wow. And yeah. that's part of what I think Raskolnikov sees through to and is so appalled by. Do you know what I mean? It's just furious with that uh, mistreatment, I think. And I think he tries to make himself uh, more important than he actually is and thanks mm -mm. to. He has this allure of incredible importance. Mm -mm. That just doesn't yeah. really exist. Yeah. And he's always on a Dostoevsky is always on about his, his clothes, like losing kind of has bought this sort of mauve suit and sort of matching gloves and his mm -hmm. pocket kerchief. And he's absolutely sort of dolled himself up like some sort of absurd peacock. And again, that's such a contrast to Raskolnikov, who's in sort of basically a sort of black jacket that's falling off him yeah. in the sort of last threads of his clothes. And against, you know, the two are so offset against each other. It's absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find Joseph, I mean, anything you do, it's incredible, Joseph, but I think this this role, it suits you so well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can you can also feel it like in the way you talk, so calm and so <laughs> like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> Funny. Um, considering that this was written in 1866, what elements for each of you do you think are going to resonate with the modern audience? Why this story now? I, I don't think we evolve as humans. I think we keep committing the same mistakes uh, <laughs> over and over again. So I think the story repeats itself. Um, so it's, yeah, we present it today and it's a today's story. Yeah, I think it's also told a lot through the complexity of Raskolnikov's head, mm -hmm. which makes it not set in any sort of 
place, any sort of time. So it's, I don't know, I feel like similar mental struggles that people face now. So there's still always a relatability to the book. And I think that's more what we're drawing out of. Yeah, it's true. I think like, especially it doesn't, you don't have to look very far to see like, there's so much happening in this world right now that's devastating. And um, it's just a very clear portrayal of how I think we all as human beings think that we're incapable of really horrific acts. But you know, this is someone who is put in such poverty and such extreme, such an extreme position that they they're justifying doing something really horrific. And mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. everyone had mentioned and just mentioned, it's timeless. Yeah, I think when I first read it, I was just gobsmacked by how modern it is for a novel from 1866. I know I'm reading it in translation, but I think it was because before I trained as an actor, I studied psychology, and I think I read it then when I was studying that and I remember just going wow it he gives a kind of really clear exploration as Joseph you're right inside the mind of a person with quite well not quite with real mental health issues in a time when psychology as a science was absolutely in its infancy in 1866 there was the kind of first murmurs of psychology beginning but the number of the times in the book that he uses the word psychology it's true, and, yeah. And Raskolnikov is quite conscious of his own psychology and he feels his own fracturing as a person as he fractures. And so, you know, and the reason why Helen and I chose it, among many reasons it's an interesting book, is that I kind of, I do think this is sort of roughly true, a lot of great Russian literature, I'm being generalist, but kind of works laterally. So if you read War and Peace, it's generations, multiple families, multiple locations, wide time frames, absolutely extraordinary kind of width of vision across time. And then this book is like a kind of bullet fired out of a rifle. It's incredibly focused. And yes, it's 600 pages, but it actually goes straight down in a very constrained time frame of a couple of weeks. And for what at the most simple level if you to be reductive is a cat and mouse. It's Porphyry the detective on the trail of the murderer, Raskolnikov. And this thing about will he catch him? Will he confess to it? Of course, there's many, many layers of complexity around that and lots of other characters. But at its most simple level, it goes, that's the trajectory of the piece. Mm -hmm. And so it always felt that there was a way to kind of catch that energy. Does that make sense? On stage and deliver something in a couple of hours. Of course, look, in a couple of hours, we can't do a 600 page novel. We can't even pretend to try. That would be ridiculous. But what we can do, I think, is catch some of the energy of it, catch some of the drive. I think you guys can speak much better than me to this, but one of the things that dance is just amazing exploring is relationships and emotional relationships and also experience because it's so actually embodied. And so the feeling of what it of what Raskolnikov feels like, does that make sense? I don't think you'll come away from this and go, oh, I've read that book. But I think if you came away from this and then read the book, you go, oh, I recognize those people because you spent time with them. That Mm. makes sense. Yeah, that's beautifully said. It's true. It's like, it's not a, it's not a whodunit. It's when is it it sort of is a thriller. Oh, sorry. No, but it sort of is a thriller. Do you know what I mean? It has a, it's like a modern thriller in structure in some ways. Hmm. Well, continuing along that line, um, <laughs> with well, with uh, specifically adapting it for the stage and for a ballet setting, what liberties did the artistic team take, and what similarities? What did you s- literally pull from the novel, James? And what liberties did you have to take to translate it into a ballet? I think that, um, so Helen and I, when we'll work on a new adaptation or something, we'll both read the book independently of one another and then make a set of notes or pull out sections that feel like they could work on stage or work well in movement. Um, And then afterwards we cross compare which bits we pulled out. And as I said the other week, amazingly in this, we pulled out the same bits very much. So there were certain things that we just went, wow, 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 this is really strong. Sometimes you have to be really, you're just partly looking at what 
you can communicate effectively on stage. And it's an endless job that we have to do, which is to be the unknowing audience all the time. So we'll sit and watch a scene. I'll sit and watch a scene and go, okay, if I hadn't read the book, if I hadn't read the program notes, because I couldn't be bothered to pick up a program and I watched this, what would I get? And you accept that there'll be stuff they don't get. That's fine. So you're constantly choosing. I think sometimes there's been lots of times where we telescope scenes together, um, where we put elements that we thought were powerful or important for a character or a set of dynamics from one scene and put them into another. So there's a scene that we have, Joseph, where <clears throat> Joseph's in the rooms that he's hired uh, for Dunya and Raskolnikov's and Dunya's mother, and they bring Sonia to him to look for help. And there's this moment where, where Sonia is uh, a person that they've come across. She's a 17-year-old girl who's having to work as a child prostitute to help fund her family, and her father's just died. And in the actual book, that scene takes place in your bedroom, Cassie, doesn't it? And her man, it's in your room. And the, the women are kind of like quite taken aback and affronted by having someone who's working as a prostitute in the room with them. So there's this quite moment where they sort of brace at that. And then they they hear her story and they soften a lot. And so we wanted to bring that together with a scene with losing. I didn't want to lose that moment actually of seeing that the, the, the women actually trying to negotiate the how do they adjust their relationship to Sonia and understand her. Because I think that's important, important for us for lots of things about Sonia's character and also about those two women, about how they relate to her. And so we picked that up and put it into a scene where they're not meant to be there at all. <laughs> But actually, when you put them together, you don't, you try to keep hold of what feel like fundamental building blocks for characters. Does that make sense? And, and so, yes, telescoping definitely happens. Um, and sometimes we have to insert little threads that are missing from the book so that we get to understand what's going on. So there's a character called Svidrilikov, um, who's a very nasty piece of work, who comes to the city and starts to sort of trail Dunya because um, he's trying to force her to marry him. And so we will physically get him to trail them on stage. He's sort of tracking Raskolnikov through the city. And that's not in the book necessarily. It's not explained in that way. But because we can't talk about it, we have to see it. Those sorts of things. Um, another thing that we did or have done that I picked up from Helen, actually, it's a very useful thing, particularly in dance, is a thing called a signifier, I would call it. And we had it in the crucible we used one, which is a physical object that in the book might not get the same focus, but because we can't speak about things in dance, we can use to help the audience track their way through the show. And in this, it's a T-shirt, or it's a shirt, that uh, Herman and Cassia and Brie and Joseph, after they've done the murder, they're covered in blood. And so in the book, he goes and hides actually objects uh, from the flat of the woman that he murdered, and he sort of buries them under a stone. And we hide this bloody T-shirt. We see... Raskolnikov wearing it just after the murder. He's then terrified of what to do with it and goes and hides it. And we can then track that because he can retrieve it. He can use it to confess to the murder. Someone else can grab hold of it and use it as evidence against him. So these sort of things that you give an object a significance for the audience and then you let them understand its journey. Uh, it's very helpful actually, because they can track that story through the object. That's another thing. So that shirt doesn't exist in the book in that way, but we use it. Hmm. How's oh. that? <laughs> that was a great answer, James. Um, for the dancers, uh, embodying these really complex characters, have you found anything particularly challenging or any very personal breakthroughs when you've sought out to portray these characters? I think one thing I've really, really enjoyed about the process is um, I think we're being encouraged to sort of make um, acting choices that are different every single day. Um, I find in a lot of the ballets we do, there's sort of a, um, the goal is to like replicate a lot. Um, and you sort of know exactly how you're supposed to feel in every moment. So that kind of has to be like fabricated and maybe made to be a bit larger than what feels comfortable. Um, 
but I know James and I have had some conversations about where I I'm trying to just sincerely let things sort of hit me in the moment and it might feel different every day. And I'll look at James and be like, but is it big enough? And James, you're pretty much like, well, we can worry about that later. Right now it's about finding the right impulse and the authentic response to the moment and what is your partner giving you in that moment. And um, I've enjoyed that process of just kind of um, approaching the work like it's a piece of theater uh, rather than a dance piece, um, even though the dancing is extremely important. Um, and then also the physicality of Raskolnikov is very grounded and very creature-esque. And that's been really uh, fun to play with. And um, Helen will often make phrases and each of us might interpret the phrase a little bit differently, but the the uh, execution of the movement needs to feel like the same texture, whether it's um, fractured or like you're being pulled in, in opposite directions. Um, you know, her uh, being a, a dancer with Forsyth is a huge influence to her. And there's a lot of improv techniques that um, she she pulls from in order to create and generate the movement as well. And that's been um, really cool to to play with for me. Yeah, yeah, I think that the process... Go ahead, Joseph. I was just going to say, I think, too, something that um, James says a lot is uh, I'll be like, oh, what do you think if we try something in a different way? And he's like, uh, try it. Mm -hmm. We'll only find out if it works after we see it. And so that's been, I mean, such a gift and a challenge as well, because it, it pushes us to really go out and try more different things. And given to different emotions through the steps and and then we find okay that wasn't it so then you have to try it again in a different mindset and different place but that uh, type of work really I think for me gets me further into the character and then allows you to feel a bit more confidence through the character because you've built your character through the rehearsal process and through the creation instead of kind of like Cassie said, what we're used to of learning a ballet and having already what is right, and what is wrong, learning off of what other people have done in the past. I, I was going to say in the, the challenges that I'm facing now going through this process of creation is, for example, the moments that we switch from reality to the dreams. Um, I think those are the moments where I feel, is the audience going to get it? Um, how do they know we are dreaming in this moment? And so as a dancer, that's where I'm, I'm feeling the, the challenge to really switch movements or feeling either slower, kind of slow motion, you know, as happens in dreams. Um, and that's what I'm finding now working on the character, that those switches um, sometimes I need to be very drastic to understand the switch of scenes and, and character. Um, and I just feel that creating new pieces, we need more time. And unfortunately at AVT, we're going to have to like create and perform. Um, but there, yeah, I think I find the challenge there um, when switching these emotions. Yeah, I think one thing you've all been brilliant at, and it is a particular thing to do, that I think I come from an acting perspective with it, and then Helen comes from the same place in the movement. And it's a note I gave you the other day, Joseph, which is about allowing yourself to not know. I mean, it sounds silly, but of course, you do know exactly what you're going to do, because you know the steps, you know where you're going to go, and that's what's going to happen. But the character doesn't know. And so you, you have to not go ahead of yourself in the scene, because otherwise, all performers do it. It's not just dancers. Singers do it and actors do it. You tidy yourself up. You smooth the corner because you know what you do. And actually, your character doesn't know. So you have to genuinely try to be in the moment of it. To do that, you have to be supremely talented and have brilliant technique, which, thank God, you all do. But yet it is true that you have to be completely confident in that. And then you go into a space where you don't know. I had a director when I was younger again. He said a really useful thing, which is that in a scene you have a set of stepping stones that to fulfill the scene, you have to step on. 
you know and if it was a kind of agatha christie play you've got to actually put the poison in the glass of whiskey to give to the person to murder blah as dancers you have a certain set of steps that you have to fulfill but the way you go from stepping stone to stepping stone is different every night so you may have the step to fulfill but the way you negotiate that step is different every night do you mean so that your investigation is always active in that time because you're not replicating you're actually doing in the moment and that allows a capacity to change and respond to the people on stage and change the people around you i think it's what's really exciting and you do that and it's suddenly real you don't have to act or pretend on top you know and then the thing you were saying cassie about focus yeah that's partly a lot of that is down to helen and i to create the focus but i worked i don't know if you've ever seen war horse or that show with a I worked with a, the South African company that did that, Handspring, for a year on a show. And they were, Adrian was amazing. He was saying you could be in a 3,000 seat theatre. And if you've got the focus right, a puppet can just move its little finger and everyone in the audience will see. Everyone will see the puppet's finger move, even if your puppet's this big. And actually, if we get the focus right, you can just shift your eye line and the entire theatre will notice. So actually, you do have to be a bit sure and clear that you're communicating and you've got to send your energy right to the back of the theater. But if you're specific and if the stage is focused, we'll get all of it. Audiences are incredibly sensitive, I think. That's, and that's very exciting, I think. No, it's beautiful. And it's such an enjoyable thing <laughs> to do and to exercise, um, to feel like you are acting from the inside out rather than trying to mm -mm. from the outside in <laughs> um yeah it's been a gift yeah. it's really interesting and again alongside that and again it's a good note for all of us to think about actually in the next few weeks <laughs> which is i always think when you're making We're a now. <laughs> really tricky challenge and it comes to helen and i and it comes to isabel in the music sutra in the design jennifer in the lighting tal in the video and then also to all of you with us is especially when you're creating a new piece, is don't have anything you don't need. Totally. You may have loads of stuff you really like or stuff that you think is great and this works really well. But if you don't need it, you have to get rid of it. And that's how you create the focus, actually, is by editing and distilling so you don't have anything on that stage happening that you don't need to happen. And then we know what we're looking at. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's a kind of absolutely... And it often means you've got to get rid of things that you really like i have to i have to go i really like this bit and actually we don't need it so we have to not have it mm -hmm. that process is is real actually and we're right in the middle of it <laughs> but it's it really important effort it really is mm. yeah it's amazing actually speaking to that being a part of the editing process because i feel like as dancers we come into a piece you know a century later and it's been edited and it's at its final form but to be a part of the process and to understand why things are being cut away or added on it just gives you a whole new understanding of your character yeah amazing. um speaking of characters what was the thought process behind having raskolnikov be portrayed by both male and female dancers um and then for the dancers how does that knowledge that a different gender is going to be dancing the same role affect your performance or portrayal of it, or does it? Shall I go first? Doesn't matter. Um, it was actually Tal, the video designer, who first brought up the idea of having Raskolnikov dance by both genders. And the instant he said it, Helen and I both went, oh yeah, that makes sense. I think, the sort of manifold reasons, really. Um, one of which is that goes back to the complexity of the person we were just talking about. And these really complex characters. What one wants to do, I think, when one sets out to make a piece of work investigating something like a book like this, I was talking about this this morning, is never to explain it, but to try and explore it. And it's like, to really explore that character, actually having the more breadth of life experience and personality that we can bring to it with the different dancers, the more we really explore Raskolnikov. And so, as I say, in, in theatre, there's a tradition of 400 year old tradition of different genders 
playing different roles. And more recently, has Fiona Shaw or Glenda Jackson have played Richard II, or they've played King Lear, or Catherine Hunter did it last year, a couple of years ago, she played King Lear. And no one in that case goes, well, they don't, you're not regendering King Lear. It's not part of a, it's, it's part of an investigation of that character to see what that actor, how they explore that character. And in opera, the same, it's kind of mezzo-soprano, it's for 300 years, it's sung what we call trouser roles. It's absolutely a given in every Handel opera will have that happen. And so in ballet, I think, because often I was saying, I'm a relative newcomer to dance. And sometimes it's quite surprising or it's been surprising in classical ballet, how gendered a world it can be. Because at one level, at a most basic level, it's kind of who can lift who. Because lifts take place and they'll look at the dancers and go, well, you can't put this person in that person because that person can't lift that person. They need to be with so-and-so. So there's a kind of level of kind of mechanics that goes on. And I remember saying quite early to Helen, Raskolnikov doesn't particularly feel like a person who's lifting anyone. <laughs> it's, not really, it's just, he's in a different world. And so to really explore it in the most kind of extensive way possible, it seemed to us really interesting to have that work done by both men and women to see what they brought to this person who is so complex and so three-dimensional that it seems only sensible to have that happen in some ways. That makes sense. Because then you're really, really looking at all the different aspects of this person. Um, and it's been great working in the room and absolutely fascinating how I don't, I've, I've got used to it. But I never kind of go, there are sometimes all four dancers are dancing Raskolnikov at once. And you just see four Raskolnikovs. You don't think, oh, there's Cassie doing it and there's Joseph. Does that make sense? That's Cassie being Raskolnikov, there's Joseph. It just, you see the same person. And as Eman was saying, you can have the same steps from Helen fulfilled in very different ways, but they're all exploring this person. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's been pretty awesome. I, it's funny, Tal actually said to me after one of our rehearsals, um, there's a pretty like, epic smackdown between uh, Raskolnikov and Luzhin between Joseph and I and um, yeah sort of like a fight scene and, and Tall afterwards said to me wow it's it's amazing like the physicality that you're finding of like a young man and I kind of laughed at him and I was like Tall I'm not I'm just being myself <laughs> it's like I'm not trying to put a different gender on myself at all I'm I, I'm not thinking about it too much I'm taking clues from the text and from all the work that we're doing and I'm applying it to what my instrument is capable of um I think uh then sort of pulling from personal experience to kind of enter into the emotional journey of Raskolnikov throughout the ballet is undoubtedly like my own and I do identify as female but the movement vocabulary that's being asked of me is you know it's what I have to offer with the the body that I'm in and what I identify as but otherwise it's not really something I'm thinking of um it's just what my experience is going to bring to the role physically and emotionally yeah, I think you know, because the exploration, talking about exploration is the of the character, it's it's not about gender, it's about actions. And anybody could be a mother. So in, in this case, we are, are going into these emotions and, and actions. And so what I what I find uh, incredible and I think and for the audience perspective is that every show is gonna be a different show. Um, and, and I think that's amazing how we can create, um, you know, it's going to be every night is going to be a fresh performance because we are feeling in a different way and we'll portray the role in a different way, but also because we are, yeah, we're exploring the, the actions, no, not a, you know, a gender. Yeah, I, I would just say too, I don't think it's something I've really ever paid attention to in the process. When we're in the studio uh, creating something new or working, even learning something that 
we've already kind of put together. It's something that we're all just contributing to. The the thoughts and the ideas of the character come from the group of everybody in the room. And I feel like for Helen and James, it's pretty general to any role, not not even just Raskolnikov, but it's about how everyone has a different interpretation of things. And exploring a character as complex as Raskolnikov, I actually really think having sometimes different perspectives of life and of things in that way ends up kind of building a richer narrative and storyline for us. I think it's exactly that, Jadrin. I think that the, the drawing on, you know, and, and working with you all to create the piece with you, the more breadth we have and depth and your different ideas and your different experiences, the lived experiences, then the richer the character that we can start to explore becomes. I just think it's really useful. I mean, at one level, anyway, you know, the crime and punishment that you read, Joseph, will not be the same one as I read, which will not be the same as Cassie reads, because when you meet a piece of work like that and you read the book, I'll read a different book. You just do, because I'll have a whole set of resonances from my, that I read a different thing. And actually that variety of experience and how people experience, you know, a work of art, whether it's a painting or a book, that negotiation between yourself and it is what you bring to the piece of work as both a performer and then the audience does the same. So this kind of conversation uh, going back and forth between an audience and the piece or between the performers and the piece is alive. And I think the more, the more alive it is and the more kind of points of view that are inside it, the more interesting it is. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Def I mean, definitely, I love all of this. Um, James, what has it been like for you to work specifically with ABT dancers? Absolutely just a so night, uh, just. Honestly, oh, James. God, it's just, no, they're brilliant. <laughs> they <laughs> can't wait to leave. <laughs> they've all been brilliant. No, they're great. I mean, amazing. I always think dancers, anyway, are just sort of extraordinary. And in a way, you're kind of all crazy. What happens? Honestly, there's loads of people I can't see here on this webinar because you're all invisible to me. These people, it's mad because Helen and I are inside one process, no? Do you see what I mean? So we're inside crime and punishment and we're sort of you know, neuroticizing about it. Oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. But you, how many ballets are you rehearsing at the moment, you lot? Yeah, it's insane. And they're rehearsing them. It's not that they do crime and punishment for three days and then do two days and something else. They're doing all of them all the time through the day. So they may come in and spend an hour with us, you know, going through a scene which might be emotionally very difficult and traumatic, and then jump out of that hour into another ballet, then into another one an hour after that, then into another an hour after that, then come back to us. So I don't, honestly, it's extraordinary. And all of that, and you've done class to start with. So I find that all of your abilities, not only in terms of technique, which is top level, but your ability to kind of commit to all the different processes, which are which are asking of you different ways of working between the different processes. Some are ballets which are well known, some are new creations, some you've danced before, some you haven't. I think to kind of keep the level of commitment you manage to each of those chains, those parallel chains, is absolutely extraordinary. So yes, I don't know how you do it, to be honest. So kudos, hats off. So yes, great. I think you're all brilliant. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. <laughs> that was really sweet. Thank you. That's right. I really meant it. I think it's absolutely crazy. I don't know how you do it. Incredible. I'm glad I asked. Um, <laughs> dancers. <laughs> We've sort of touched on this already, but how do you approach learning a brand new ballet that you're creating from scratch versus revisiting an old ballet or learning even an old ballet for the first time? What is a different, what's the difference with this? It's just kind of like James is touching on it, you know, with the schedule that we're keeping right now. All I can think of as you're asking this question is I'm trying to have a lot of patience with myself and uh, retain as much as I possibly can. And I think I said this to you the other night, James, I was like, I feel so confident that I know exactly what the actions are in every single scene. 
but I cannot for the life of me remember what the steps are right now. <laughs> I was like, I can tell the story by just standing here, but you give me some steps to do and I'm like, ah. So I'm just trying to like have in uh, a lot of grace for myself right now and um, just continue to remain open to the process. But what it's like to create something from scratch is, yeah, everything that we've spoken about, we're we're learning what it is in real time. And that's such a gift to develop uh, not just the movement vocabulary, but the the uh, the characters together. It's very collaborative and um, yeah, it's been so much fun. I would Jeff just say um, step by step, like starting the ballet, we had kind of completely different intentions and characters than what we have now. And I think part of that is as you build more and more material, you find more out about the character. So I don't know. I, I think it's just like you take it day by day. You're going to learn something more about whether it's the steps, the actions, or your specific character through the process. So I think it can be easy to get frustrated with a process very early on because things don't make sense, but it, it really over time builds into something different. And like I said before, it's a completely different character, especially for illusion um, at this point now than what we had even four weeks ago. No, I think, I think creating new pieces is a gift. Um, uh, but with that gift, it comes a big responsibility in a way that, you know, also in, in your real life, you're putting a ballet together that you know already, you work those hours in the studio and then you go home and you are yourself. But when you're creating a new character, it's kind of in your head all the time. And so I find that that you need to find that level, how to, you know, get home and and be yourself. Um, I think getting into especially this type of characters where they have so many layers, um, they have this pressure on your back that um, they they become in your head like all day. Um, but definitely, you know, for me, creating it's it's what I love to do. It's kind of you know writing history. Awesome. Okay, we're nearing the end, but one final question and keep it short and sweet, James. Um, what do you each, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, what do you each hope the audience will get out of crime and punishment? James? You're brave asking me first. I was trying to come up with a one word answer, just three words, <laughs> a ticket. Um, Oh, I kind of, because I'll be really quick. I will be quick. I think because I'm coming from not necessarily a dance, well, definitely not a dance background. I think, I just really hope that we make a piece of work that's kind of open to everybody. That actually you could watch it, watch these amazing dancers and know, you know, as someone who watches a lot of ABT work, but you could watch it as someone who loves theatre and get stuff from it. You could watch it as someone who loves Dostoevsky or is interested in the book and gets away from it that actually that we're making a thing that actually has a kind of very wide open quality to it does that make sense at the highest level from everybody working to the top level of their abilities to make something that actually anybody can watch there you go I'll shut up now yeah anybody can watch and also I feel that um, even though this is a very kind of dark story the ending will appeal to almost everybody because you 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 finish in a way that you feel okay there's hope there's second chances um you know you can change the course of your life uh, so i think uh, ultimately there's a nice message there yeah it's true i honestly don't feel like i have much more to add than the two of you have already covered it's um it's also going to be really exciting to see the company um, 
move and dance and tell tell a story in this way in a in sort of a new fresh way the design element is really really beautiful as well I'm I'm really excited to get into the theater and it's visually very stunning uh I would just say I hope they leave with kind of a different sense of society maybe I feel like like Cassie brought up earlier you feel empathetic for the character at times and you also hate him at times and so I think if the audience can pull some of that out of the story and bring that into reality and or at least, you know, contemplate, talk and think about it, it'd be pretty cool. Beautifully said. Amazing. Well, we're almost at five, which means that it's time to wrap up our conversation. But I wanted to extend a huge thank you to our panelists for sharing their time and insights with all of us. And thank you to those for watching and taking the time to learn more about this amazing new work. You can watch ABT, panelists, myself included, perform Crime and Punishment during the 2024 fall season at the David H. Koch Theater at Lincoln Center in just a few short weeks. The fall season runs from October 16th through November 3rd, with Crime and Punishment running from October 30th through November 3rd. For a full schedule and casting and to purchase tickets, please visit abt.org, abt.org. We look forward to seeing you at the theatre and thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much and thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Claire. you. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>